we've been looking at the idea of time. All of us have to deal with time. It's part of our life every day. We have a time to wake up, a time to eat breakfast, a time to go to work, a time to come home, a time to eat dinner. All of the, everything's by a schedule. Everything's uh, at a certain time. And we only have a certain amount of time in every day. Then we don't get more than that, just a certain amount every day. So we have to learn how to take this wonderful gift that God has given us 24 hours every day and then use it in an effective way. So we're asking God to help us to, uh, to use our time wisely. And today you can see on the stage we have lots of rocks. Big rocks, little rocks, all kinds of rocks. We're going to build something together today. We're going to do a building project. How many of you are contractors? You do building. Well, okay, well, th don't worry about it. Everybody can participate. You don't have to be a construction worker. You don't have to know how to use tools. None of that stuff. We're going to build together today. We're going to build something important together. Let's talk about how you build stuff, okay? I, I want us to just think about, we may not need tools this morning, but we need some wisdom. We're going to talk about how we build this morning. I, I get a chance to use our chalkboard. Ha <laughs> ha! So let's talk about constructing something. If we're going to build a house, let's say we already know what kind of roof we want. So let's do that first. Let's build the roof first. Yes? No? But I know what I want on the roof. I already know what's going to be there. I know what kind of, uh, I know what kind of shingles I want. I got the shape, everything's figured out. I want that first. And so later on, I'm, I'm still working on the other things, but then I figure out the, I don't know what I want for the walls yet, but I know where I want the windows. So I'm going to put the windows in. And then I know where the door is going to be, so I'm going to put the door in, okay? So now our house is coming along, right? It's looking pretty good. Oh, I know what I want for the walls. They're going to be like this. So, so our house is done, right? Huh? What's missing? Oh, yeah. We got to do the foundation. There's a priority in building, isn't there? You have to start at a certain place. You can't just pick where you want to start. And you have to go in the right order. So you have to start... Down here at the bottom, you have to start at the foundation. This is important. This foundation is critical. If you don't have the right foundation, you can't build anything else. It's got to be right. Somebody say amen. amen. It has to be, even if you're not a contractor, you know this. You know you can't put the roof up unless you have the foundation and the walls to put it on. So there's an order, a priority. You can't just build any way you want. There's a timeline. There's a timeline. You know, the, everything we do in life, it comes back to this idea of time. You could mark out a timeline, beginning, middle, end. Right? There's a beginning, there's a middle, there's an end. There's a place that you're going, but you have to do it in the right order and you have to use the right priorities along the way and the foundation is the right priority when you're building a house so let's use that metaphor to think about how we build our church our church is at an exciting place I said our church is at an exciting place <laughs> somebody say amen it is it's amazing what's, what's been happening in this place. We've taken two different congregations. Last year, we brought them together to make a brand new church. That's pretty amazing. That doesn't happen a lot. And it's not always successful when people try it. But God has guided us. 
God is leading us and he's helping us to do something for the kingdom. And it's amazing what God is doing. We, but we have to think about how we're doing this. I told you early this year that I feel like the Lord spoke to me back in January that this is a year of new beginnings because we're a new church. Horizon Church has been in Birmingham for 77 years. That's a long time. But today's Horizon Church looks very different from the Horizon Church of 1939. In fact, it wasn't even called Horizon Church. It was Norwood Assembly. So things have changed a lot in 77 years. Not only in this church, but in the world around us. But we, we've got to consider that we're in something new. And so we have to work on building new leaders, building new ministries, coming up with new plans, and everything's coming along well. But in a situation like this, it can be tempting when you're doing something to jump ahead. Well, let's move ahead because we know what the roof is going to look like, so let's go there. But wait a minute, you haven't finished the foundation yet. So we have to, uh, in our church, we have to take things in order, at one step at a time, piece after piece after piece, right? It's the same way in your own life. You say, oh, I know what kind of job I want. I'm just going to go get it. Did you do the training? Did you go to the school you need to go to? Don't go to an art school if you want to be an engineer. Right? I mean, there's a plan and a priority, and you take things one step at a time. What about in your Christian life? Are you building your walk with God one step at a time? Today, I want us to think about what we're going to build because we're going to work on the foundation today. We're not ready for the roof. We're not ready for the walls. We're still building the foundation. And the foundation is prayer. Can y'all see that back there? How many of you need glasses? <laughs> prayer. <laughs> prayer is the foundation for our life and it's the foundation for our church. We've got to make this strong, very strong. If we can't build a strong foundation of prayer, then nothing else we build will last. Right? Nothing else we build is going to be successful unless we build a foundation of prayer first. You can plan the best ministries you can hire the best people. You can do the best marketing. But if you don't build all of those things on a base of prayer, you will fail. We will fail. We will not succeed. So we've got to have this base of prayer in our personal life and in the life of our church. We need to have a base of prayer. I believe that every time we've been successful in this church, it's been because we first of all set out to, to be people of prayer. When, when we are prayerful people, we are successful people. When we are a prayerful church, we're a successful church. So I want us to go back into the scriptures for a few minutes and look at what the Bible says about this. And I want us to go back to uh, Genesis chapter 12. Pastor Fabricio, a few weeks ago, was speaking about Abraham, about how God called him to leave Ur, to leave his family, and to leave his home, and to go to a new place that God would show him. Remember he had the tent over here? And he talked about the tent. Abraham came out of his tent. God gave him a promise. Let's go to Genesis chapter 12. And let's look at verse 7 and see what God said. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring, I will give this land. 
And then what is Abram's reaction? What does Abraham do? It says, so he built a home and a fence and a garden and he built barns and he built livestock fences. And no, it doesn't say that. A post office and a mall. What did Abraham do? He built an altar. When God said, I'm going to give you this land, Abraham said, I'm building an altar. Why did Abraham build an altar? It was a focused place of worship. Abraham said, God spoke to me this day in this place. And this altar is going to mark a time. A time and a place where God met with me. And God gave me a promise. And now this is a focus for me to worship God, to speak to God, and to hear from God. So Abraham didn't build a house. He didn't build a farm. He built an altar. He built an altar. And it wasn't just a one-time thing. Because Abraham, Abraham stayed there for a little while, and then he picked up his tent and he moved to another spot. Because this, was, this happened in Shechem, but look at verse 8. From there he went on toward the, hill, the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built his house, finally. No. There he built what? Another altar. Everywhere that Abraham went in the land that God promised him, he didn't build homes in a kingdom he built altars he built altars he said this is a place for us to worship this is a place for us to hear from God to speak to God Abraham was concerned about building altars it's a place of communion it's a place where you and I can meet with God The altar is a doorway between earth and heaven. And when that doorway exists, the people of earth can speak to the God of heaven. Does that make sense? The altar is a place to communicate with our God. To speak to our God, to hear from our God, to sacrifice to our God, to honor our God, to worship our God. That's what an altar is. I know we don't build altars today, do we? We don't have to build altars today because Jesus was the last sacrifice uh, on the altar. And he paid the price for all of our sins. And so we don't have to build any more altars. Not, Not this kind of altar. But we do have to build an altar in our heart. We do have to establish that this is a place and this is a time when, when I'm going to speak with God, when I'm going to hear from God. We need altars in our life. Not, not because we need to sacrifice sheep, but because we need to sacrifice our life. Because we need to hear from the voice of heaven. We need to meet with God. Abraham was on a journey. He was traveling from Ur to Canaan. But it wasn't just a journey where he was traveling through the land. It was a journey of faith where he was traveling with God. He didn't take this journey on his own. He had someone guiding him, leading him, being with him. The altar represented the fact that Abraham wasn't alone. He wasn't by himself. He was listening to God, following God. God was with him. God was leading him on his journey. So can I ask you a question? Where are you on your faith journey? Do you have a regular time to meet with the one that you're supposed to be traveling with. We are not traveling on a faith journey by ourselves. We're traveling with God. We're being led by Him. But if you don't hear His voice, 
how do you know where to go? If you are not listening to his voice, how do you know what you're supposed to do? It's a good question, isn't it? Think about that while I drink some water. <clears throat> how do you know what to do? If you don't spend time with God in prayer, you, you can't be led by the Holy Spirit <laughs> because that's when we hear from God. That makes sense, right? It makes sense when we, we talk about it, but then it seems like we don't do it like we're supposed to. If we're not spending time in the presence of God, we're not hearing from His voice, then we can't be challenged by Him. We can't be comforted by Him. We can't be led by Him. We can't express our love and devotion to Him. We can't let Him know how we feel. None of that is possible if we're not spending our time with God. If we're not building the altar in our lives. Now I know that in this room this morning, we have some people who have been saved for a very long time. And you have really built your prayer life. I know we have prayer warriors in our church who spend time with God on their knees and, and they do a great job of praying. But I also know that we have people in our church who are younger Christians and, and maybe not as strong with your prayer life. And maybe you could use some help. Well, this morning, I want to help you a little bit with your prayer life. I want to show you something very simple that can help you build a deeper walk with God. How many of you pray like this? You sit down to pray, and you're like, I'm going to pray today. I'm going to do this. And you get ready. You start praying, and you run out of stuff to pray after about three minutes. <laughs> you're done. <laughs> you can't think of anything else to pray for. You're done. Or... After five minutes, you're out like a light, <laughs> okay? Maybe it's because you haven't learned how to pray. You haven't learned what to pray. And so I'm going to give you a couple of tools today that will help you with that. And the first one I'm going to give you is a very, very simple tool. It's a simple guide about how we can pray. And what we can pray. I got to get a, an eraser. You have uh, a bulletin. And in the back of your bulletin, you have a guide. It's not a great eraser, is it? Maybe it'll be enough. All right. Now, we're going to look at four simple steps to prayer. And each one of these steps... Uh, begins with a letter that we can use those letters to spell the word Acts. In English, Acts is the, the name of the book of the Bible after the four Gospels. It's the story of how the church grew. If you read the book of Acts and you want to know how the church grew, I want you to notice something. Every time, excuse me, every time they prayed, the church grew. Check it out. Read through the book of Acts. When the church got together and they prayed together, the church grew. God did something amazing. So let's look at this. So we're going to look at four steps in prayer, and we're going to build it off this simple word, Acts. Can we remember that? It's pretty easy, right? I don't know if this translates into everybody's language, but it works in English, so let's, let's go with it. And the first one is adoration. This feels so old school. It's, so, it's vintage, man. It's not old school. It's vintage. Adoration. So let's talk about adoration. Adoration means worship. It means expressing your love and your devotion to God. How many of you think God wants to hear our adoration? 
How many of you think God desires for you to express your love to him? Doesn't he? Okay. Look what the Psalms say. Let's take a look at uh, Psalm 95, 6 through 7. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. He is our shepherd. He is our Lord. And and the scripture says, come and bow down before him and worship. Last week we had uh, Pastor Ron Cox with us. Wasn't that a great message? Wow, what a fantastic service that was last week. And he, he mentioned the Lord's Prayer. He talked a little bit about the Lord's Prayer. The first part of the Lord's Prayer says, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Our God is holy. We begin with worship. We begin with worship. Now, that, that doesn't mean that you have to uh, sing like Carrie Joby. You don't have to sing like Michael W. Smith or whoever. That's not, that's not the only thing about worship. People think worship is only the music and the singing, like what we did at the beginning of the service. Worship is an expression of love to our King. Yes. That's it. Yes. Do you know that when you help somebody... That's worship. Do you know that in the original language in Greek, the word worship means serve. Serve. Worshiping God is serving God. Whatever we do to serve God, that's a form of worship. But in our prayer time, worship means expressing with our voice and our heart how much we love our God. Adoring Him. Loving him for who he is, for who he is. So then we're going to move on to C. C is confession. How many of you are without sin? Can I see? Maybe it's because I can't see. Anybody raising their hand? No? We all sin, right? We all mess up. We all have our own problems. When we go to the Lord in prayer, we want to begin with worship, but we also want to move on to confession. You can spend a lot of time in worship, in adoration, expressing to God how much you love Him and and appreciate Him. And I think some of us can spend more time than others in confession. Right? If you start thinking about how you lived in the last 24 hours. What were your thoughts? What were your actions? What were your intentions? What was your motivation? What did you fail to do that you know God wanted you to do? All of these things, we can think of where we fell short, where we didn't do what God wanted us to, or we did things that we know God didn't want us to do. Confession is important. Let's move to another psalm, Psalm 41. Psalm 41, 4 says, I said, have mercy on me, Lord. Heal me, for I have sinned against you. We need to confess our sins. If you want to know uh, a really good lesson on confession, read Psalm 51. Psalm 51, you can write that down. Go look that up later. If you, if you haven't heard, there's a story where King David, the greatest king of Israel, sinned horribly. He committed adultery and he committed murder and he lied. And God confronted him on it. And then Psalm 51 is his confession of sin. Read that and you can see what, what it looks like when a heart is truly sorry for their sin and repentant. Repentance means You turn away from the sin and change your way. It's not good enough to confess your sin and just say, I'm sorry, God. We also have to make an effort to change our life and not do the sin again. When when, uh, Jesus was confronted by 
bunch of the religious leaders, they dragged in a woman who was caught in the act of adultery. After everybody left, she was sitting there in front of him, and Jesus says, I forgive you, but he also said this, go and sin no more. Stop it. So confession includes repentance and changing our ways so that we don't sin anymore. All right, let's move on to the next one. T is for thanksgiving. And I'm not talking about turkey and dressing, <laughs> although I like that. <laughs> I love the holiday of thanksgiving, partly because of the food, Okay, mostly because of the food. But I love Thanksgiving because it focuses on the idea of thankfulness. Because we live in a world where a lot of people are not thankful. A lot of people in America think that uh, the world owes them everything. Oh, you owe me. No, the world doesn't owe you anything. We should be thankful for what we've been given. We should be grateful. When, I don't know um, if this happens in the country wherever you grew up, but in America, uh, when we were kids, our parents try to teach us to be grateful. And so whenever we get a gift from somebody, the mom always says, or the dad says, now what do you say? And the child is supposed to say what? Thank you. We try to teach our kids to say thank you because we want them to grow up to be grateful. Grateful. Yesterday, we went to um, the race. It's a lot of fun. We had a great time. And while we were there, uh, there was a, a little thing set up with, uh, for robotics. And they had all these robots in there showing how uh, manufacturing is done for cars and things. And there was one robot that had a control panel with a computer screen, and this man was talking about how it all works, and there was a little boy there and his mom, and, and he was explaining that you program the robot and tell it what you want to do, and he said, this robot has already been programmed. If you want to tell it to, to do its instructions, you push the play button on the computer screen. So the little boy pushed the play button on the computer screen. And all of a sudden, this arm starts moving around. And it's doing all kinds of stuff. And it goes over and it picks up a piece of paper. And it drops it. And then it pushes the paper through this little hole in the glass to the boy. It's like, whoa. So the boy picks up the paper, you know. And the mom says, what do you say? And the boy thought for a minute and he went, wow. Wow. Uh, what do you want him to do? Say thank you to the robot? <laughs> the, the robot doesn't care if you say thank you, <laughs> right? <laughs> but it's like programmed in us. What do you say? <laughs> you just receive something. You say, thank you. Thank you. Do you say thank you to God? Huh? First Thessalonians 4. Or five. Boy, my contacts are not working well today. First Thessalonians 5.18 says this. Give thanks most of the time. No. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. All circumstances. Whether things are going great or things are not going well at all. Give thanks. It's important that we give thanks. Um, and by the way, we've got some uh, images I want to show. Show the first one, Jan. I want to say thanks to Deanna. She's helping us with our social media. And we started on Wednesday, started an Instagram account for the church. In less than 24 hours, we already had 30 followers on Instagram. And so every day you're going to get a little bit of inspiration that will show up in Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Make sure you follow the church on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. You get this little inspirational thought every day. Look at this one. I think this was yesterday, last night. It says, when you fall to your knees and ask God for help, don't forget to fall back to your knees and say thank you when he answers. Say thank you. 
Remember the story of the ten lepers and Jesus healed the ten lepers and they left? One of them came back and said, thank you. And Jesus said, what about the other nine? Are they not thankful? And then this morning I noticed another one. You say, well, I don't know what to thank God for. Well, let's look at this next slide. When you awake alive in the morning, thank God for it. How many of you woke up alive today? Thank God. Thank God you're alive. Hallelujah. Can you be thankful today? (laughs) Every day we can be thankful. All right. Now we come to the last one. Supplication. My handwriting is getting worse and worse as it goes down. (laughs) Supplication. It means asking God for help. It's last. Most people do that first and then they stop. Well, I don't know if I should say most. A lot of people start with supplication. They ask God for something and that's it. They're done. They just want to ask God for help. How many of you enjoy hanging around people that only talk to you when they need something? Huh? You got a a relative like that or a friend or maybe somebody you work with? They never talk to you until they need something and then they talk to you. Man, that's annoying, isn't it? Can you imagine how God feels? The only time you ever show up at the altar is when you need something. What? God's like, Dude, I'm open 24-7. Where you been? <laughs> so we, we do, but I say that, and you think, oh, well, maybe we shouldn't ask God for anything. No, you should. God wants you to ask. He wants you to. But he doesn't want you to only ask for something. There are many other things we can do. Do you think that if you did worship and confession and gave him thanks for all the things that God did for you in the last day, and then begin to ask him about the things that are important in your life right now, do you think you could spend more than five minutes doing that? How many of you think you could spend more than five minutes in prayer if you just did that, right? I I would venture to say that it's easy to spend 20 minutes or 30 minutes or 40 minutes if you really went through this and just did that. So that's that's a simple thing. But I think it's helpful for us. Um, Okay, I do have one more. uh, Philippians 4, 6. One more verse. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, my prayer and petition... With thanksgiving, present your request to God. Yes, God wants to hear your needs. He wants to know your requests. So it's okay. Ask the Lord. Because God will help you. God will take care of those things for you. I'd like all the ushers to come back, if you would please, for just a moment. Because I want to give you something else this morning. In addition to something simple like this on the book of Acts, would you just divide that up for everybody? Give everybody a paper. This is about the Lord's Prayer. You know, we call it the Lord's Prayer, but it's really our prayer. It's something we're supposed to pray. And so Jesus gave us the Lord's Prayer as a way for us to connect with God through prayer. We can, uh, we can pray that prayer exactly like it's written. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We could pray it exactly like that and there's nothing wrong with that. That's wonderful. But we can also use it as a model to show how we pray. So in this In this prayer, you find things like worship, adoration. You find confession. You find supplication. Those things are in there. But then what this does for you is it breaks it down so that you can spend an hour praying if you went through and prayed all of this. 
Because it becomes fresh and it becomes new every time you pray. Because your life changes every day. Your situation changes every day. And there are new things going on in your life all the time. So there are new things for you to pray. But this guide will, I think, will be helpful for you. So, by the way, you see that um, it's in both English and Portuguese. One side is Portuguese, one side is English. I should have done Spanish too, but this will be helpful, I think. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Look at all the names of God that are listed there. The names of God. El Olam, you are the everlasting and eternal God. You think you could spend a little time worshiping God and thinking about how He's eternal, He's everlasting? Because you're everlasting, your love never fails me. Because you're everlasting, your mercies are new every day. Because you're everlasting, I don't run out of hope. Because you're everlasting, oh God, you're eternal. You'll never get tired. You'll never wear out. You'll never get weak. Our God is everlasting. See, these things help you to think about how to worship God. You can think, oh, you are God, Jehovah Jireh. You are the Lord who provides for me. I know that I'm in need right now, but you are a God who provides for my needs. And so I thank you, God, that you are Jehovah Jireh. I thank you that you're the Lord who provides. On and on it goes. All of these different names of God and what it means. And then it goes on to talk about how your kingdom has come. Ask God to establish his kingdom in these areas. And you may not pray all those areas, but some, of them, some might be on your heart that day. God, we need your kingdom in our schools. Because I've seen what's been happening, Lord. We, we need your presence in the schools. Touch our teachers, Lord. Give them your spirit and your presence. And our administrators, touch our students, Lord. Let your kingdom operate in their lives. You, you understand how this is like a guide. It's just a, a, a template for how we pray. And then you add in all the important things that you can think of to pray. Give us our daily bread. Oh, I'm sure you can think of areas where you have needs in your life. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. We need to take time to confess our sins, right? Ask God to forgive us. Lead us not to temptation. And there are many things there you can pray. So this is just a, a guide, and I want you to use this. Make a time for prayer. The most important thing we can do is set it as a priority. Remember, it's, well, it's gone. Now I erased it. But it's the foundation, yes. right? Yes. It's the foundation. It's important. And this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to build an altar. We're going to build an altar together, all of us, working together. I want our worship team to come back. We've got some more songs we want to sing this morning before we leave. It's still early, and I had planned this on purpose. I planned a short sermon. I don't know how long I preached. I hope it wasn't too long. I wanted to have some time for us to, to practice what I just preached. Because you know something? I guarantee you that most of you can't remember what, what I preached the last time I preached. You can't remember most of what I said. You probably remember the tent from when Pastor Fabricio preached. We remember things like that. But the content of the message, a lot of times I think it escapes us. We need to do something. And today we're going to do something. We're going to build an altar together. And, and I think that um, when we do stuff, it helps to plant that in our, mem in our memories. Whoa, prayer is important. It's the foundation of what we do. So they're going to start playing. And while they start playing, I want some of the, first of all, I want some of the men in the church. Would you come help me grab these big rocks? And we're going to come over here and we're going to build the foundation for our altar. So come on, men. I need some guys that can pick up these rocks and let's bring them over here yes. hallelujah now here's the last part supplication and here's what I want you to do this morning 
We have little pads of paper up here on the uh, up here on the stage in lots of pens. Take a piece of paper, write your need on the piece of paper, and then take that piece of paper and roll it up. I can't roll. Take it and roll it up and stick it in the altar. Stick it in the altar and trust God. Trust God to take care of it. And we'll leave this here for a few weeks and every week you can come, put another one in there, put another one in there and let's fill it up with all of our needs. We're bringing them to the altar. And then in a few weeks when we take the altar down, we'll take all of those and we'll put them in the clay pot over there where we normally put all of our prayer requests. But for now, we're gonna stick them in the altar. So take your request, stick it in there. And, and then I wanna encourage you something else. Be here Wednesday night. I told you, prayer is the foundation of our church. It's extremely important. If we're going to be successful, we've got to pray together. I want you to pray at home every day. But at least one day a week, I want you to be here. The doors are open from six to seven. And you may not can pray for the whole hour. You might not be able to get here until 10 minutes to seven. That's fine. But at least spend some time in here together, praying for our church, praying for our community. Let's do that together. I believe when we get serious and get on our knees before God, we're going to see great things happen in our church and in our community. But if we fail to pray, we won't have victory. Every victory that we have is a victory because of prayer. Amen? Amen. I guess... Um, Let me just pray one last prayer with you. Then I want you to come up and, and write your prayer request. The worship team's gonna sing a little bit longer and you can hang out and worship or whatever you like to do. Well, I'm gonna pray with you one last time. Father, I thank you for everyone who's here. I thank you that you are a God who has an open door policy. You let us come into your presence. You welcome us into your presence. Thank you for that, Lord. I praise you for that. God, as we gathered here today, we have together built an altar. Together, Lord. And so, Father, I know it's only a symbol, but my prayer is that we would not just build an altar with stones, but we would build an altar of prayer in our lives and in our church. We need you, God. We all need you. Help us, Lord, to make it a priority in our time to set time apart for only you to spend time with you in prayer. Now, while everybody's still praying, is there anybody this morning who's not a follower of Jesus? You're not a Christian, but this morning, the Holy Spirit, you feel something in your heart and you want to give your life to Jesus today. If that's you today, you want to give your life to Jesus, will you raise your hand this morning so I can pray for you? Anybody today? All right. God, I thank you for your church. Thank you for your people. I pray for your blessing upon them, Lord, that you would continue to guide us, lead us, Encourage us, Father, as we pursue you in our journey of faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you come and put your prayer requests in the altar? The worship team is going to keep singing. I love you guys. I look forward to seeing you on Wednesday night. We're going to have a great time together.